Hey, Open Bible. Um, wanted to uh, do a little Bible study with you. Uh, this is um, something that's been on my uh, heart and mind uh, most of this week, and I just uh, really wrestled with uh, this um, past weekend's um, events. Uh, really um, so hard to think about, so hard to uh, process, and um, a great deal of my mental energy has been spent on uh, trying to um, walk myself through evil and um, uh, just just wickedness in in such a profound way, and that's been um, occupying a lot of my uh, mental space and uh, thinking about you <clears throat> as a church, and uh, we did a study uh, probably ten years ago on. Um, evil and suffering and I was reviewing some of that and thought that maybe it was helpful to share again um, um, sort of a theology of evil and uh, this obviously bears upon so much uh, that our world is going through evil and suffering so much that we're going through because um, this as a Christian this is one of the things that you're going to have to deal with um, your entire life questions about uh, God as it relates to evil and suffering, and there's uh, very few people who do not wonder um, why would a good God allow evil, or why do good people suffer, we would often hear. We don't know why everyone suffers in one way or, or another. Um, Jesus said in John 16, 33, even of Christians, in the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. We know that overcoming is um, in the future, it's going to come, but we know that the trouble is now, it's present. And if I were to ask you um, those two questions, why does a good God allow evil and, and why do good people suffer, I wonder what your response would be. Um, so I, I, I want to walk us through a... Uh, a biblical uh, kind of a framing, framework for evil and suffering um, uh, so that you could have something to say to somebody. This will be a little bit philosophical, but very biblical. Um, chances are you've probably heard other people say things about evil and suffering in the past and, and maybe things like God's not responsible for evil. He certainly didn't he didn't do it. He didn't, he didn't make anyone sin. Um, God doesn't make anyone suffer. Sin causes suffering. And of course, that, that is all um, true, at least partially true. But it, it doesn't answer the full question, where does sin come from then? Um, who gave man the free will to choose sin and, and so on? This is the stuff you need to know to be able to deal with real-life questions. Um, why did my husband leave me? Why did, why did my spouse have an affair? Why did my baby die? Why do I have cancer? Why do tsunamis drown a quarter of a million people? Why do towers fall down and, and, and kill people? Why do viruses exist and spread so rapidly and kill so many people? Why do armed gunmen wreak such unimaginable havoc on quiet neighborhoods and devastate so many lives? The Bible is not silent on those things. Um, when people came to Jesus in Luke 13 and they said, what about these innocent people that were walking down the street and a tower fell on them and killed them? What about them? Jesus said, you better repent or the same thing will happen to you. Hmm. They followed it up by asking, well, what about these people that were worshipping in the temple and Pilate's men came in and slaughtered them? I mean, they weren't just innocent bystanders on the street. They were inside worshipping and Jesus said, you better repent or the same thing will happen to you. I'm pretty sure that wouldn't be a very um, satisfying answer to the people who were asking that question. Well, this is a statement that I hear in our community a lot. I just, I just can't believe in your God because there is so much evil, too much evil, too much trouble, too much suffering in the world today. And we got to be able to answer that question. Trouble is all around us. We have economic trouble in our world. I look around at the, I'm not a stock market guy, but the stock market's crashing, oil trading at ridiculously low prices this week. 
Uh, looks like recessions um, are, are moving um, quickly towards us, um, really maybe all around the world. Uh, trouble with this virus, trouble with this horrifying situation in small town Nova Scotia. One of the main reasons I think um, the people of this world reject our God is the is issue of um, trouble, evil, suffering. They just can't accept that God is who he says he is if the world is the way that it is. How can the God of the Bible that's portrayed um, loving, gracious, merciful, kind, compassionate, gracious, how can that God, that same God, allow such um, massive evil, massive suffering? How can that be? And they, and they might put that together in, in an equation. So you've got um, this biblical God that is loving and good and holy. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. And yet massive sin and evil and suffering dominate the world. Therefore, the biblical God cannot exist. And that's how a lot of people think. that That's a problem for us. How do you expect me to believe in a God who is loving and all-powerful and then explain that the world is the way it is? And, and this question has backed many a Christian into a theological corner over the years because they don't have a viable answer for that. And, and you need gotta, you got to have an answer to this question. you got to be able to understand and believe with all your heart that there is a biblical answer to this question. And we should be able to pro proclaim it. Um, get the message out there. With COVID-19 going around, one of the things that has been shut down is, um, sadly, for, for guys like me, um, all major sporting events. Um, but there has been some uh, interesting news in the uh, football world this week. Uh, not only uh, is Tom Brady uh, heading uh, south, um, most decorated quarterback in NFL history, going to be playing for a new team this season, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, but not only that, his uh, this last couple of days, it's been noted that uh, his star tight end, previously from the New England Patriots, is coming out of retirement, and uh, he's going to be joining his uh, quarterback in Tampa Bay this year, Rob Gron Gronkowski. Now, I don't even know if they're going to be able to play a season this year, but as a sports fan, certainly I'm hoping they can. I, I really like football. And if you know anything about football, you, you know it's a bad thing to be backed into your own end, back, you know, down inside the five-yard line with, with, you know, you're on your, your fourth down with maybe 30 or 40 yards to go before the first down. That might mean nothing to you. But your only option in that position is to punt the ball just kick it away let let them have it just try and kick it over there and um, <clears throat> I think one of the things that we do as a Christian church sometimes is we we punt um, like Deuteronomy 29 21 29 rather um, the, the secret things belong to the Lord and we just sort of kick that as far away into opposition territory as we can is that really the best we can do? Is that all we have just to sort of throw out Deuteronomy 29, 29? We don't know. We don't understand. God's the only one who understands. And so so we're kind of innocent to, to answer that. I, I don't think that's good enough. I think scripture speaks to suffering and evil in such a way um, that we can believe things and we can understand things and we can live inside of that answer. Now, it's not a short answer. That's why this is not a short video. Take some time to think about this. That's why trite, cliche, uh, rote answers, uh, maybe like you and I heard when we were growing up, aren't good enough. They're not satisfying for us anymore. Why is there so much evil in the world? Why is there so much suffering in the world? Well, God's not responsible. Okay. Well, why doesn't God stop it then? Why doesn't he, why doesn't he put a ceasefire to all the evil in the world? Well, he didn't start it. Adam and Eve started it. Well, well, then why did God allow Adam and Eve to be able to even make such decisions for themselves? Why did God even create them? Didn't he design them in a way that, that you know, why didn't he design them in a way that they couldn't do those kinds of things, couldn't do 
sinful, rebellious, evil things? Why did he give them the possibility to sin? Why in the world would he put a, a sinful creature in the form of a talking snake into a perfect paradise? Well, well, God's not responsible. The devil is, someone might say. Well, why did God create angels then with the capacity to fall and one of them to become the devil? You see, see one of the things you got to realize is that sin started in heaven, in God's domain, where God was in control of all of that, made all of the creatures that were there, gave them all the capabilities that they had. So all of the short answers, they just don't get us anywhere. They lead you back to God. So you got to build your answer. I believe you have to build it on God. You can't just blame Adam and Eve. You can't just blame Satan. Your answer has to begin and end with God. So this is not a, a new topic for theologians. They've been wrestling with it, and I'm not a theologian. Um, I borrow a lot of this um, from uh, some theologians, some other pastors. Uh, John MacArthur, I heard, it, heard John MacArthur speak on this many, many, maybe more than a decade ago that really influenced my thinking on this. But theologians have been wrestling with this subject for years now, decades now, um, the issue of theodicy. Theos means God. Dike means justice or righteousness. So the question is um, the justice or the righteousness of God in allowing evil. So I'm going to try and put an answer together, uh, thinking through the scripture. And I'd like you to think through this with me as a, as a church. So let's state some things that we know. First, first thing that we know is that evil exists. True or false? <laughs> It's pretty self-evident in days like this. And everyone's going to agree with this. Nobody in the right mind is going to try and argue that evil exists. Of course it does. It's dominating our world, our society, our province. But there are several categories of evil. So let's break them down. First is what I would call natural evil. I'm talking about um, cursed creation, acting upon human beings with... Um, physical um, suffering, even deadly results, impacts. So diseases, disasters, catastrophes, everything from tiny bacteria to tidal waves to tornadoes, uh, from viruses to volcanoes, the whole world is affected by uh, really, really bad things. And I, I don't, I don't even, I'm not sure if you know this or not, but the the first actual cure for like any disease actually came in 1885. First ever cure for a human disease. No cures before then, none. You got a disease, and if it had a track of fatality, you, you were gonna die. Black plague, bubonic plague, terrible, horrible uh, history. What do you know about the uh, what is known as the Great Influenza, or the Spanish Flu in 1918. Um, from what I've read, a few guys were enlisted to go into the army, fight in the First World War. Uh, they go to um, Kansas, seems to be that first epicenter, the first place. They get the flu, caused by some tiny little virus. And before the Spanish Flu, the Great Influenza ended, started in Kansas with just a few guys. Upwards of a hundred million people around the world were dead. A hundred million people it just could not be stopped. Every scientific approach was tried. Every medical system that we have in North America today is actually a result of the great influenza. All of the great medical centers came into existence trying to stop that particular virus. And they still don't have a cure, from what I understand, for that particular strain. If it comes back, it will do the same thing all over again. They now know that the only way to stop that kind of a virus is to keep people who have it away from people that don't have it. That's why we have right now going on social or physical distancing. That's where it became a thing in the first place. By the way, just on a side note, you ever wonder why our church or a lot of churches use little tiny wafers or little tiny cut up pieces of bread and not the whole loaf grabbing from or, or individual little mini cups of juice that we use for the Lord's Supper? That's a result of 1918 and the pandemic, the Spanish flu. 
so that Christians weren't touching the same loaf of bread, weren't drinking from the same cup. This, that's the kind of world that we're living in again today in 2020. And you think you can protect yourself from a microscopic virus that you can't even see. This whole world is just full of really, really bad things. Humans live at the mercy of a corrupted culture and a cursed earth. Romans 8 says that the whole of creation is uh, it's groaning. But not only is there natural evil, there's also moral evil. It's the kind of evil that people do to each other. People acting in an evil way towards one another. That's exactly what this past weekend was. It was evil personified. Evil inside of a person. There's no other way to describe it. To even think of those kinds of atrocities, let alone act them out over a 12, 13 hour period, can only be considered one thing. Great wickedness. Pure evil. And just as our world, this planet, is cursed, so hum the human race is that inhabitants it, it is, is cursed. Romans 3 says that there is none good, no, not one. There is none who seeks after God. All of the thoughts and intents of the heart are um, only evil continually, Jeremiah says. The heart is deceitful, desperately wicked above all things. Man's heart is full of passions and desires that conceive and bring forth death, James 1 says. I don't think there's anyone in Nova Scotia, I don't think there's anyone in Canada for that matter, disputing the fact that we live in a world full of moral evil. It's devastated individuals, devastated families, devastated neighborhoods, devastated small towns. Moral evil is everywhere. It's not just here and there, it's pervasive. It's, it's everywhere. And then there's something um, classified as, thirdly, supernatural evil. So you add into this the mix of uh, the host of demons, um, obviously Satan, the father of lies, murderer from the beginning, he's called, and all of his host of minions that make up at least, uh, we would say, a third of the angels. Um, masses of angels that fell were thrown out of heaven, vile beings that have had thousands of years to perfect, perfect their um, evil craft and express it upon this corrupt planet. And by the way, that's why I'm so thankful for our human government that's designed by God to reward those who do good and punish those who do evil. Human government acts as a restraint for evil police, courts, judges, law, um, prison. And the family also acts as a restraint against evil. When you've got parents teaching and training their kids, giving them discipline and self-control so that they can manage their lives. You don't, you don't have that in the de demonic realm. There's nothing in the system that's going to restrain evil. The system is evil. The system promotes evil at every level. It's been going on for thousands of years. It's, it's very old evil. Talk about people have, it's old money. It's been around for a long time in the family. This, this, this is historically evil. It's old wickedness, wily, crafty, scheming wickedness. And it has massive influence over the people of this world who are the children of Satan. So you have corrupt people infused by a supernatural evil that's not going to go anywhere good. And at the same time, you have this cursed earth, viruses, plagues, all kinds of natural disasters. And it begins to feel like it's coming at you from every angle, doesn't it? Add to that sort of this final evil or eternal evil, hell, which is nothing but evil. Evil is the only thing that exists there. There will be an absence of everything good and sweet and right eternity without God, without Christ. So evil exists. Well, that's point number one. Point number two is that, well, God exists. And we're not arguing that. 
The God of the Bible is the only true and living God. He is, as the Bible describes him, all-knowing, all-powerful, all-wise, merciful, gracious. He is compassionate. He's kind. He's tender-hearted. He's good. He's holy. He's righteous. He's just. He is love. He is wisdom. He's all of those things that the Bible says he is, but maybe most important to our discussion, the Bible says that he is sovereign. That's what it means to be God. He's in control. He's in charge. There is nothing that exists. There is nothing that occurs. There is nothing, therefore, that ever will exist or ever will occur that is not designed within the purposes of God. First Chronicles 29 11 and 12 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. That's that's sovereignty. Psalm 115 verse 3 says, But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Daniel 4.35 says, He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, What have you done? Again, over and over in the scriptures, they affirm the absolute sovereignty of God. And while I admit it's a challenge um, a challenging truth to uh, fully grasp or comprehend. Why would I think that it would be any differently than that, since I am finite and we're talking about an infinite God? When you try and take God and put him into your brain and make sense of it, um, there's going to be a whole lot left over. Um, so Deuteronomy 32, 39 says, Now see that I, even I, am he. And there is no God besides me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Nor is there any who can deliver from my hand. Exodus 4.11 says, So the Lord said to him, this is speaking to Moses, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now, I know there's a, an awful lot of Christians trying to get God off of the hook of all of those kinds of things. Sin did it. This world is evil. Bad things happen. Just by chance, randomly. It seems to me that God is not trying to get himself off the hook, nor does he need us to try and get him off the hook for these things. Psalm 105.16 says he called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. You say, who, who said something like that? Who called for that? Some wicked, perverse, insane king? No. God called for that. 2 Kings 17.25 says they did not fear the Lord, therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. Lamentations 3.38 says, Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that woe and well-being proceed, bad and good? By the way, the greatest holocaust by far that ever took place was what? The flood. Who sent the flood? God did. It was an act of God. There's no human explanation for it. There's no natural explanation for it. It's God. How many people did God spare in the flood? You can show it on two hands. Eight. We, we know that part. Eight souls saved. But how many were not? How many were judged? How many drowned in the flood? I've heard numbers anywhere from 8 million to 50 million. I've heard numbers as high as 100 million people on the earth at that time. And while many theologians and everyday Christians like you and me try desperately to get God off the hook for these things, God is quick to point out that he is absolutely 
sovereign over everything that exists, and he's not shy to admit it. He does not need to be rescued from some bad press. He says, I'm God, I'm sovereign, make no mistake about it, I'm in charge, I'm in control. 1 Timothy 6.15, for example, says, He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Revelation 4.11 says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Proverbs 16.4 says, The Lord has made all for himself, yes, even the wicked for the day of doom. God made it all, angels and men and planets and stars and the sky and the earth and the mountains and the seas and the deserts and the plains and the lakes and the streams and the sun and the moon and the rain and the snow and the ice and the insects and the elephants and the birds and the fish. He made it all and he allowed sin and then cursed everything that had been made and it has wreaked havoc in the world through his judgment since then. When you think about the Old Testament, there are very few miracles in the Old Testament that are not judgments. The, the predominant miracles of the Old Testament feature God killing someone or some group of people. The Lord does what seems right to him, 2 Samuel 10.12. Psalm 103.19, the Lord has established his throne in heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Isaiah 14.27, for the Lord of hosts has purposed and who will annul it? His hand is stretched out and who will turn it back? Isaiah 46.10, I will do all my pleasure. 1 Samuel 2 verse 6, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. Amos 3 verse 6, if there, listen, if there is calamity in a city, will not the Lord have done it? Seems to me that God controls absolutely everything. Nothing is outside of his purpose. Nothing is outside of his plan. Nothing is outside of his control. He knows everything that can be known, has always known everything that can be known before it even existed. And has comprehensive power to do anything he wants to do. That's what the Bible says about God. That is the true and living God. The only God that exists. So that leads to the next step. One, evil exists. Two, God exists. God is sovereign. Nothing happens outside of his control. Therefore, number three, God, some would say allows, other would say wills evil to exist. Or else that it wouldn't exist because he's absolutely sovereign. It couldn't exist if he didn't will it to exist or allow it to exist. Isaiah 45 verse 5 says, I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you, though you have not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. And yet, he is absolutely holy, as Habakkuk says. He does not even look upon evil. He's not responsible for evil. He does not tempt anyone, but God wills or allows evil to exist or it wouldn't exist. But in order to, again, keep God off the hook for the evil that is expressed in this world, many Christians and theologians have strayed from the Bible, I believe, and created their own versions of God. They'll say things like, for example, God's not all-powerful. He can't be. He knew about evil and what it would do because he's omniscient, he's all-knowing, but he's not all-powerful to stop it. Or else he would have. Or, or some might say God is all-powerful, he could have stopped it, but he's not all-knowing. He has sort of limited knowledge. In technical terms, theologians use the term process theology here. And for them, God is a, a whole lot better now than he used to be. You know, like thousands of years ago, you know, he's coming along. He's getting better as he goes. Why? Because he's figuring things out as he goes along, as they happen. And then there's something called open theology or open theism. Um, 
Uh, in other words, God doesn't know anything before uh, it happens. He, he, if it hasn't happened, it's not knowable. Therefore, God doesn't know about it. And he's just like you and me, just kind of, wow, look at that. Uh, and now what do I do? And he's, he's forced to respond to things that happen. No matter what you come up with, that God doesn't have the power to do anything, or he wills not to do anything, or he really doesn't know what's going on. So he's just kind of like the rest of us, just reacting to everything as he goes along. But, you know, he's getting better. He's getting better at it because he's facing the same things over and over and over again in different places, and he's figuring it out. He's, he's getting there. Just be patient with him. Really? I mean, does that mean that the cross was some sort of an afterthought? It was like a plan B. Whoops, uh, what do I do now? Now that, now that we have sin. Okay, well, I have an idea. Let's try sacrifices for a couple thousand years. Oh, man, that's not working. Um, let's try a cross. Maybe that will work. You, you kind of get the picture. It's a man-centered theology a, a process, not a God-centered process trying to get God off the hook for evil because it's a God, quite honestly, that offends them. That's the bottom line. They won't accept a God for who he is because they don't like that version of God. So they got to create a new one, more suited to their liking, one that's made more into their own image. What, what that is really saying is that we somehow have some higher moral standard than God. And that, that is a very... Uh, dangerous place to put yourself elevated above God. So how do you answer the question then? If God allowed evil to exist, and clearly he did, why? That's a fair question. Perhaps you'd ask it this way. If God knew that some people would wind up in hell for all eternity, why did he create them with the ability to sin? He could have created them any way he wanted. I mean, Adam... Quite frankly, he asked that question. He's like, I went to sleep single one night and I woke up and all of a sudden there was this woman. Don't, don't blame me, God. The woman you gave me. And most people say he's blaming the woman for his sin. But in that re moment, what he's realistically doing is he's blaming God. God, the woman that you gave me. This is your fault. If God knew the people who were going to make the choices that they were going to make, why did he make them? Or does he not know? Maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he's not able to do anything about it. Human beings are clearly making a mess of this whole world, doing whatever they want on their own. Demons are destroying everything in this world, doing whatever they want on their own. And God is in this a mad scramble to try and read and react as fast as and best as he can to make sense of it and make some good out of it. I just have to say that is not the kind of universe that I want to live in. It is not the kind of God that I want to worship. Would you rather have a God trying to get a hold of evil, trying to grasp at something, or a God that is in total control over it? Unless this stay in just like classroom mode right now, let's get deeply personal. What are you going to tell the mom who just lost her baby? You going to tell her that the, that the devil did it? You going to tell her that the God she loves and worships was powerless to stop it from happening? That he didn't know? That he didn't care? None of those things are helpful. I remember hearing... Uh, many years ago, John MacArthur tell the story of uh, a charismatic church in Southern California where the pastor was up, he was leading the service, and a prophet from uh, out of town was there. And um, the prophet came up and prophesied over the pastor that he, he would do all kinds of miracles and healings all over the globe. He'd be the sort of the, the world's prophet um, in, in the future. And he finished the prophecy this is in the church service, lots of people there. He finished the prophecy, and the pastor that he prophesied over fell dead. Just a young guy. When the church was asked, what happened to that prophecy that was 
that was made just before he died. And, and they said, well, the prophecy was true, so Satan came along and killed him. Is that the kind of world that you and I want to live in? That, that God has a plan, but Satan can come in and kill the people who, who he has planned to do great things for him, and, and Satan can kind of come in and wreck every all of God's plans, that God's not really in control, but Satan is? I mean, in the aftermath of that event, a, a ton of people left the church, and most of them stated that they just couldn't live any longer under the quote-unquote sovereignty of Satan. I don't want to live there either. So here's the right question. Evil exists. God exists. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. God wills evil to exist. He didn't create it. He couldn't. He's God. But he did not prevent it. He allowed it. And here's the fourth point. He created it for a purpose. God has a a, a purpose for evil. I misspoke there. He did not create it for a purpose, but he has a purpose for it. This is why he wills it or allows it into existence. You say, what would that purpose be then? Well, listen to the Westminster Confession from the 1700s. These guys got together. I, don't know, I read somewhere that it was over like 1,100 meetings over 10 years trying to hammer out this sound doctrinal statement. And here's what they said about evil. Let me read this for you. God, from all eternity, did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Yet so as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second-hand causes taken away. Sinfulness proceeds only from the creature and not from God, who being most holy and righteous, neither can be the author and approver of sin. That's clear. He, did, he does not create it, author it. But then, says the Westminster Confession, all that God decrees and all that God providentially brings to pass, good and evil, is all, all of it, to the praise of his glory. And they're right. Evil exists. God exists. God wills evil to exist, allows evil to exist. But it's for a purpose. What's the purpose? For his glory. That's what the Bible says. Now, take your Bibles for, for, for just a second, if you have one, and turn to Romans chapter 3 and verse 5. And just look through a couple of verses in Romans for a minute. Romans 3 verse 5 says, But if our right, unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? What did that say? But if our unrighteousness demonstrates, proves, shows, displays the righteousness of God. Now, that's an incredible, this is the ph philosophical argument that Paul is making, and, and this is the biblical argument that we ought to be making. Our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God. Another way to say that would be, would you properly understand the righteousness of God, the the awesome righteousness of God. If you didn't understand unrighteousness, if you had no concept of unrighteousness, if it was just only righteousness around us at all time. So our unrighteousness, our sin, makes it possible then for God's righteousness to be on full display. It's the power of the contrast. God's beautiful righteousness against the backdrop of our ugly sin. So, if I brought a candle into this room and set it before you and lit it right now, how much difference would it make in a room that's well lit? Would make any. But if you shut the lights off at midnight and you walk into a pitch black room and you light a candle, how much difference does it make there? Against the backdrop of darkness, light is so beautiful and so clearly seen. And of course, our sin gives God the opportunity to demonstrate his righteousness. Where? At the cross. You say, why does God want to demonstrate his righteousness? 
because he wants to be honored and glorified and praised for his righteousness. It's all about God demonstrating. Turn to a, another one here in Romans 5 verse 8. Again, notice the word demonstrate. Romans 5 8 says, But God demonstrates or proves or displays his own love. Here's the second one. Not just his righteousness, but his love. He proves or demonstrates or displays his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Would we understand righteousness without unrighteousness? Would we understand love without being a sinner? Would we understand the love of God in Christ to us if we did not understand how sinful and undeserving and wretched we are? Would we understand the significance of the sufferings of Jesus on the cross for us? See, the cross is the greatest display of the love of God. It is a beautiful demonstration of the love of God against the backdrop of sin. Our being sinners, our being enemies, allows God to put his love on an open display for us. So Paul says God demonstrates his righteousness in a context of unrighteousness. God demonstrates his love in the context of unworthy sinners, you and I. But then turn to Romans 9 verse 22. Romans 9 verse 22 says, What if God, wanting to show his wrath, here's the third one, wrath, and to make his power known, show his wrath, make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. No sin, no display. So God allows evil to put his righteousness on display. God allows evil to put his love on display. Here in chapter 9, verse 22, God allows his allows evil to put his wrath on display. But not only his wrath, mixed with his wrath is his holiness. That's what brings upon wrath. It puts his holiness on display. He's not like us. He is he's a holy other. Would we know God the same way that we know God without sin? Of course not. We wouldn't know that he's as righteous as he is, as loving as he is, as holy as he is. God uh, allowed sin so that he could display his wrath, his holy anger over sin, his judgment on sinners. No sin. No display of righteousness, no sin, no display of love, no sin, no display of wrath or holiness, but not just his wrath. Verse 23 of chapter 9 goes on to say, And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had prepared beforehand for glory. So, no sin, no mercy, no sin, no grace, no sin, no forgiveness, no sin, no salvation. So, the whole reason God ordains evil to exist is for his own glory, so that forever and ever, holy angels and all of us as redeemed saints will give him glory for his attributes, for who he is. Prior to sin, God was not worshipped fully for his righteousness, not the same way that he's worshipped now against the backdrop of unrighteousness. He's, he's not worshipped nor could be fully for his love until he demonstrated that amazing love that we sing and praise him for every Sunday about how much he loves us as enemies and rebel sinners. He's not worshipped fully for his holiness until his wrath is displayed on how he hates sin and how holy he is. And He was not worshipped for his grace until he displayed forgiveness and mercy on the recipients of salvation. In every case, there's this great revelation of the nature of God. Why? To display his glory. And God's glory would not be on full display were it not for sin and evil. Paul gives a demonstration of this if in Romans 9, just go back to verse 17. For the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may de be declared in all the earth. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Who raised up Pharaoh? Paul, you're saying that God raised up Pharaoh? God was in charge of Pharaoh being born, growing up in a royal family, ascending to the throne in Egypt, and then being 
the ruler over the exiled children of Israel and then making life unbearable for them and then all the plagues and all the rest that followed, the exodus, the drowning of Pharaoh, his entire army. You mean God raised him up? Yeah, for this purpose I raised you up, Pharaoh. And here comes the word again to do what? For this purpose I have raised you up that I may show or demonstrate or display my power in you, my attributes, my glory. See, this is always about God. Why God? Verse, end of verse 17. That my name may be declared in all the earth. See, in the end, God does everything for his own glory. The greatest good is God's glory. And if you don't understand that, then you don't have a God-centered worldview. You've got a man-centered worldview. So how do you respond to something like this? We'll go back to verse 14. Maybe you're struggling with this, like I have in the past. Maybe you're saying all the stuff that's happening doesn't seem fair, doesn't seem right. Verse 14 says, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is that what you think? Certainly not. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. In other words, I'm God and you're not, and who are you to argue with me? Are you in any position to argue with God? Verse 18 continues, therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? You're going to end up being very silent in his presence with nothing to say. Because you couldn't understand or comprehend the answer anyway. And then verse 20, second half, Will the thing formed say to him who formed it? Will I say to God, Why have you made me like this? Does not the potter have power over the clay? from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God, wanting to, listen, show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for dis destruction? Are you forgetting who's in charge? What should my response be to all of this? It should be, God, I have no right to question you. You are God. You have every right to put your glory on what full display by whatever means you desire. And if, as hard as this is, if evil makes that happen, we will spend forever and ever in the presence of God, extolling him in ways that never would have been possible had he not allowed and, yes, ordained without ever creating or being the source of it, evil. And in his perfect timing, it will all be over. He will destroy this. First Peter um, talks about um, the fact that uh, the elements will melt with fervent heat. And a new heaven and a new earth in which only eternal righteousness exists. But will forever we will worship him with an understanding of the full display of his glory having lived through it. And you and I will forever praise God for, quite honestly, the single greatest evil that was ever perpetrated upon this planet, the unjust murder of the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless Son of God. The people who committed the murder were guilty. Yes, they are to be blamed. And yet Acts 22, 33 says that what they did was according to the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God. So the final question is, does the existence of evil make God more glorious or less glorious? I would argue that the existence of evil against the backdrop of his attributes, his love and his righteousness and his holiness and his mercy makes God infinitely more glorious. And the good news that you can share with people is simply this. God is sovereign, he's in control, and everything that happens, yes, is within his purpose and his plan for their ultimate good and 
for his ultimate glory. Like Joseph, sold into slavery in Egypt by his own flesh and blood, his brothers endured so much evil, and yet there was a day when he could finally say, you meant it for evil, fellas, but God meant it for good. May we find that good in every suffering of life and turn to the ultimate good, Jesus Christ the righteous. Father, thank you that we could send this little um, time in your word and thought, thoughtfulness about evil and suffering out to our congregation so that they can uh, think and mull over these scriptures and pray about them, but ultimately get some answers for some things. This has not been a pleasant time in the history of the world, in the history of our province. It's very difficult. The disease, the death, the destruction to families. Um, Lord, we, um, we weep with those who weep. And yet, against the backdrop of all of this, we have a God who we want to worship. Because you are so beautiful, so magnificent, so wonderful in all that you've done for us. And yes, while the tragedies of this life are so very hard, they are, as the scripture says, but a momentary and light affliction compared to all that is prepared for us in glory. So may we hang on to that truth and hang on to you as you, more importantly, hang on to us. Thank you for your grace and your sovereignty. We live for you and we order our lives under you. May you be praised and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen.